Hello and welcome to our webinar, Developing a Strategy for Execution. I'm Paul Michaelman, Editor-in-Chief of MIT Sloan Management Review, and I'll be your moderator today. This event will be recorded and will be available to all attendees approximately three to four business days after the end of the live event. We welcome your questions for our speakers today. To submit questions, please enter them anytime in the questions module on the GoToWebinar control panel. Or you can submit questions on Twitter using the hashtag MIT SMR event. We'll answer as many questions as time permits. If you are having audio difficulties while listening via computer, please call in via telephone instead or check the help link in the upper part of your console. Our speaker today is Donald Sull, Senior Lecturer at the MIT Sloan School of Management. Don will lead us in a discussion of what it takes to develop and manage a strategy that effectively guides execution. Don, over to you. Terrific. Well, good morning, everyone, or afternoon or evening, depending on where you're calling in from. Uh, and thanks, Paul, for the opportunity to uh, to chat through with folks today uh, the topics of our discussion, which are three. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today is, first of all, what is a strategy for execution? We know a lot about what a strategy is, what a good strategy is in general, but what makes a strategy executable? Our second topic will be, why doesn't anyone know your strategy? And the odds are that no one does, or few people do, or maybe half. Uh, and why is that, and, and what can you do about it as leaders? And then finally, how can you develop a strategy for execution? Uh, so that's what we're going to uh, talk through. We'll spend about uh, 40 to 45 minutes on the content and then leave the remaining uh, 15 to 20 minutes for questions. So the first book on uh, strategy published in English was uh, Strategy and Structure by Alfred Chandler, published in 1962. From that day to today, 55 years later, there have been approximately 20,000 business strategy books published in English. What that means is uh, in a typical day, weekends and holidays included, there's not one but two new strategy books published. So given the plethora of books about strategy out there, I assume everyone knows what strategy is. But just in case uh, there's some ambiguity about what strategy is, we'll start off by talking about in broad strokes what strategy is before we get into what a strategy that's uh, primed for execution looks like. So when we talk about strategy, what we mean is a framework to guide critical choices, what to do, what not to do, which customers to focus in on, which products or uh, services to offer, your value proposition, resources and capabilities to build, and so forth. So a strategy is a framework to guide those critical choices to achieve a desired future. So you start off in a current stay here. You have an endowment of resources, capabilities, customers, market position. You want to get here to the, you know, the promised land of your desired future, your, in, uh, uh, your vision. And strategy is really the how, how you get from here to there, and in particular, a framework for guiding the, the key choices to do that. Oops. Let's see what's happening here. Sorry. All right. Um, so before we talk about what a strategy for execution is, let me just spend a few minutes talking about what a strategy for execution is not. Uh, since many times when I ask companies to see their strategy, they hand over something that I think is not a very good uh, example of what a strategy is. So I just want to dispel uh, um, some common misconceptions about what a good strategy is and, and just get those off the table, what a strategy is not. So the first thing is a strategy is not a string of buzzwords. So I was with a group of students in Silicon Valley and the height of the dot-com bubble, and every day we'd go and talk to, uh, you know, three, four, five different startups, and, I, you know, I'm a strategy guy, so I'd ask them what their strategy was, and out they would spew a string of, in, to me, incomprehensible buzzwords. So one night in frustration, I went back to my hotel in Palo Alto, and I made this little table, which I've subsequently updated every year. Uh, and how this table works is you say our strategy is to, and then you choose one word or term from each of the columns. So let me give you an example. Our strategy is to pivot to a deep learning blockchain to disrupt with authenticity. Boom, you're done. Now, the good news is it doesn't take long. The bad news is it's not a very good strategy. Uh, and the reason it's not a very good strategy is because it doesn't provide enough concrete guidance on the hard trade-offs and choices you need to make in terms of uh, uh, resource allocation, prioritization, uh, 
uh, activities, markets, and so forth that are necessary to get from where you are to where you want to be. Strategy is also not a financial projection. So a lot of companies, when I ask them for their strategy, they'll say, here's our, uh, you know, revenue uh, growth projection or uh, profit growth projection. Uh, I call this the ka-ching strategy since it typically looks like this. Boom, 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 ka-ching. We're making a lot of money. Uh, and again, it's not an effective strategy because it's not providing the requisite level of guidance on those hard trade-offs and choices necessary to uh, get to where you want to be. A strategy is also not a laundry list. Now, believe it or not, this this uh, this um, very long-winded document was from the website of a large consumer goods company in Europe that said it was their strategy. Uh, and the problem here isn't that there's not enough guidance. It's not vague. It's not necessarily uh, abstract. It's a long list of reasonably concrete um, activities uh, or guidelines. The problem is that there's so many of them you can justify anything you want to do. So an executive that was running a, a, um, a billion euro portion of this uh, this group told me he loved this strategy. And I was surprised because I didn't think it was a very good strategy. And he's a very savvy manager. And I asked him why. I said, well, it's, it's, it's the perfect strategy. You know, and somebody from headquarters flies in and says, why are you doing this? I say, oh, well, because of, you know, number two and number 14 and number 37, number 61. Uh, so his argument was that it was a good strategy because anything he wanted to do, he could justify using the strategy. Um, of course, in reality, that makes it a pretty bad strategy. A strategy is not a detailed plan. Uh, so a lot of times, you know, historically, in particular, people have talked about strategy and in the same breath talked about strategic planning. Uh, and the, the problem with detailed long-term plans, uh, as anyone uh, with a military background will know, is no plan sur survives contact with reality, uh, to paraphrase von Moltke. Um, and so, well, you know, it may be appropriate at a, um, a business, you know, to have a short-term detailed plan or to have a have a product, um, uh, you know, a product roadmap. Uh, you know, plans, of course, play a role in, in a more specific and uh, domains within an organization and over shorter time periods. But trying to have a, a detailed four, five, six, ten-year plan for a company is a fool's error because markets will change, competitors will surprise you, technologies will shift, um, and uh, it's impossible to anticipate those uh, those changes in advance. And a, a strategy needs to leave enough flexibility to respond to unexpected opportunities and threats, and uh, uh, which a, a you know a detailed long term plan doesn't uh, allow you to do. A strategy is not a thick report. Um, now, although in many cases, in many times, in uh, particularly large organizations, if I ask to see their strategy, they hand me a document that looks like this, um, you know, probably five pages longer than Anna Karina, uh, the great Russian novel. Um, and so why do, uh, you know, I've, I've been a strategy professor for uh, 20 years. And one of the things that's become clearer and clearer to me with every passing year is that the value of a strategy, when it comes to execution, the value of a strategy is inversely related to the number of pages required to uh, express it, okay? So what that means is a one-page strategy is optimal, and a 900-page strategy is pretty much useless when it comes to execution. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not saying that the analysis or the data collection uh, contained in a, a thick book like this is useless. Of course not. Obviously, you want your strategy to be based on analysis, data, uh, you know, understanding of competitive dynamics, understanding of trends and technologies, of course. But that's only half the battle. That's the uh, uh, collection of data, analysis of data, generation of pages. The other half of the battle is distillation distilling that uh, that body of research and analysis and, uh, and data down to its essence that can be used to guide those critical decisions to get from where you are today to where you want to be. Uh, and to do that, you have to not only collect the data and analyze it, you also have to distill it down to something that can be communicated, remembered, and acted upon by key leaders throughout your organization. 
So now let's come back to the question at hand. What is a strategy for execution? Uh, and so when we talk about a strategy for execution, the only thing that's changed up here is that we've added four executions. So a strategy for execution, it's still a framework. It's still meant to guide those critical choices, which markets, which customers, which, uh, which products, which capabilities you need, still need to uh, guide those critical choices to get you from where you are to where you need to be. But the key thing that a strategy for execution needs to do is strike a balance between providing sufficient guidance and concreteness to make hard trade-offs, to formulate goals, to allocate resources, to prioritize activities, to decide which investments to make now, which to delay, which not to make, uh, and to clarify what people are committing to. So the strategy for execution needs to have a threshold level of concreteness and guidance so that people can use it as a framework. That's what it needs to do, needs to be, to guide hard decisions. So that's on the one hand. But on the other hand, the strategy also needs to provide a requisite level of flexibility because there are going to be unexpected opportunities. You want to be able to seize those. You'll need to adapt to local conditions. You'll need to uh, respond to unexpected threats. Uh, you'll need for the parts of the organization to mutually adjust as they, uh, as they adapt to local circumstances. So the key challenge, the key challenge to formulating a strategy for execution is striking this balance between providing sufficient guidance to use the strategy to inform hard decisions throughout the organization, balancing that guidance with sufficient flexibility to adapt as circumstances change. And I want to be super clear here. This is hard. This is difficult, right? It's not that companies struggle with strategy because it's an easy thing to do and they're dummies. No. Organizations struggle with striking this balance because it is a very difficult balance to strike. So what we're going to do now is talk a little bit about the characteristics of a strategy that does a good job of striking this balance. Again, acknowledging all along that it is a very difficult thing to do. So first of all, there are many ways that companies could try to strike this balance. They could use pictograms. They could use diagrams like House of Strategy. Um, and they could have videos. They could have, uh, uh, you know, stories, documents. Many ways companies could pr try to strike this balance. Probably the most prevalent one is strategic priorities. And what I mean by strategic priorities very uh, precisely is a handful, typically three to five, objectives for the company or organization as a whole over the midterm. Okay, so uh, handful, three to five uh, uh, objectives for the organization as a whole over the midterm as opposed to, you know, quarterly or annual targets or long-term vision. It turns out strategic priorities are very common, particularly among large organizations. Uh, so along with colleague Stefano Turconi, uh, we looked at the, the stated, uh, the published strategic priorities of the S&P 500 uh, companies in the U.S., large publicly traded companies in the U.S. And what we found is that 71% of the S&P firms of the 500 published strategic priorities. That is to say they had a handful of uh, objectives for the company as a whole over the midterm. Uh, so, uh, and, and interestingly, as, as uh, you know, we would expect, most of those companies listed between three to five strategic priorities. Now, there were some outliers. There were a couple of companies that had a laundry list of strategic priorities, and there were, uh, you know, a handful of companies that had one or two uh, uh, priorities. But really, the vast majority of companies uh, had between three and five strategic priorities. So uh, this is a very prevalent mechanism for large, complex organizations to try to strike the balance that's critical to um uh, an effective strategy for execution. So strategic priorities are common. Uh, now, don't get hung up on the name, okay? We use the term strategic priorities, but what we find in our sample is that uh, different companies use lots of different names to describe the same thing. Uh, they talk about strategies, strategic initiatives, strategic objectives. Uh, some of them have co quite colorful terms, you know, our greatness agenda pillars or interconnected ambitions. Whether you're 
you know, your terminology is mundane, you know, strategic priorities, strategic objectives, or, you know, kind of grandiose greatness agenda pillars, it doesn't really matter. The, the key thing to bear in mind is strategic agility, uh, strategic priorities are a handful of objectives for the organization as a whole over the midterm. Now, just because a, a company or an organization has a set of strategic priorities, it doesn't mean that they'll be effective. Okay. So, uh, on this chart, we see two companies quite similar to each other, both U.S. airline companies. Both of them have uh, uh, five uh, strategic priorities. They, you know, they have different names. They're five imperatives or strategic initiatives, but they're, both of them are meant to fulfill the same function, objectives for the company as a whole over the midterm. But just because they both have strategic priorities does not mean they're both equally effective. If you look at the, uh, the priorities for American Airlines, they're quite ge generic and vague. I mean, they could apply to any airline. Heck, they could apply to any company in any industry. Focus on customers' needs, be an industry leader. My favorite, look to the future. Like, what? What does that mean? What, what would I be doing otherwise? Um, so the, the problem with these strategic priorities is they're too vague and too abstract to provide the concrete guidance that leaders throughout the organization would need to make hard trade-offs in order to execute the strategy. If we look at Southwest's uh, priorities in contrast, these are much more concrete, right? And you could imagine them much more concrete, uh, much more specific, uh, and while there's still a handful and still could be easily communicated and remembered and act upon, acted upon, um, they provide a lot more guidance to executives and managers throughout the company uh, when it comes to investing resources, prioritizing activities, making trade-offs between varying initiatives. Okay, So just because you have strategic priorities, they're not a magic incantation. It's not Harry Potter. You don't just say, we have strategic priorities and automatically you execute your strategy. No, of course not. You need to have a set of strategic priorities that strike the balance we talked about here. And as we see the American Airlines um, uh, priorities fail to provide sufficient guidance. So what makes a set of strategic priorities effective? Uh, and I and my, uh, my colleagues, uh, Stefano Tricconi and, uh, Charlie Sull and, uh, James Yoder have, have looked at this, uh, in quite a bit of depth and we've identified, uh, ba basically seven things that make strategic priorities effective in striking the balance. And what you can do for your own organization is, as we talk through these, think about how well your your company or uh, uh, organization is doing on each of these dimensions. So I'll just go through them briefly. Uh, this is available, by the way, in, a, uh, a, in an article, uh, This both this chart uh, and uh, in a broader discussion of this topic is available in an article that Paul and his colleagues at uh, the Sloan Management Review have published. Um, but uh, so you can go into more detail in, in there. I'll, I'll just move it through this quite quickly. So the first is it's limited to objectives to a handful. That matters for a few reasons. It makes it easier to communicate, easier for people to remember, therefore easier to act upon. But interestingly, that's not the most important reason for having a handful. The most important reason for having a handful is that it um, forces prioritization. Rather than a long laundry list of everything that we could think that might possibly matter, it forces a leadership team to uh, agree on these are the few must-win battles that are absolutely critical to our success. And that forcing mechanism is really crucial in uh, helping a team to get to a point where they are really talking about the uh, priorities that matter the most rather than providing a long laundry list. Focus on the midterm. Why does that matter? Look, quarterly or annual goals are too short-term. They tend to be reactive. Long 10-year, 20-year, infinite time frame visions are too, uh, too long-term. Uh, uh, you know, they, they don't inject a sense of urgency or they don't focus on what matters most. Strategic priorities are meant to focus an organization's attention on what matters most now. And the now here is three to five years, and that's not a magical number. There will be calendar examples in, you know, the airline industry for or airplane industry, you know, Boeing or an Airbus, for instance, where product life cycles, you know, could take 10 years to develop a product. They, they may have longer term priorities, and that would be appropriate. But for the vast majority of organizations, we've studied three to five years is about the right time horizon. Why is that? Well, 
One, you're striking that balance between the short term, you're trying to bridge between the long term vision and short term uh, targets. And that, that three to five years is a nice middle ground to serve as a bridge. Two, and very importantly, the kinds of things that are likely to move the needle in an organization, you know, to really uh, have a big impact on performance, whether that's entering a new market, pursuing a disruptive technology, um, uh, launching and refining a business model, building new capabilities like digital. Um, and all of these things take time, you know, and you might wish you could do them in a quarter or two, but you can't. Uh, they typically will take three to five years to do well. Pull towards the future. So in many companies, when they create their strategic priorities, they say, what's worked well in the past? Let's say we're going to do that for the next five years. That's fine if the future looks like the past. If, on the other hand, the world is changing and you need uh, your objectives to help move the organization out of inertia, move the organization out of the status quo, then you're going to have to think, what priorities will pull us towards the future, where we need to be in the future? versus reinforce the status quo, what's worked in the past. Uh, take the auto industry, for instance, industry in great flux. Now, you know, have got autonomous vehicles, you've got electric vehicles, you have competitors like uh, Tesla uh, and uh, uh, Uber and others, uh, disrupt, you know, at, on many dimensions coming at that industry. The temptation of automakers, of course, is going uh, and successful automakers is going to be to do more of what worked in the past. It's a profitable business; they know it well. Be very easy to fall into that temptation to formulate strategic priorities that extend what they're doing uh, now a little better, a little faster, a little cheaper. It'd be very dangerous. The role of strategic priorities in situations of change is to pull the organization out of the status quo towards. Uh, those things that will be necessary to succeed in the future. Make the hard calls. Strategy execution is in large part about prioritization. It's about saying we're going to do this, but that means we're not going to do that, and we're going to delay these other things. And the, that is the, the goal of strategic priorities as a, as a, as a thing is to embody here are the, of the hundred or two hundred things that are candidates for us as an organization to really focus in on and declare as must win battles. Here are the three to five that matter the most. Okay. And that requires hard trade offs. There will be very viable that those are hard discussions to get there. Uh, but managers sometimes try to dodge those hard discussions by agreeing at a very high level of generality, like we see in the American case, you know, look to the future. Great. You know, you, that's a priority, but it hasn't, there are no hard trade-offs made there. It's not, uh, or, or, you know, uh, be an industry leader. What, what trade-off is embodied in that? And what guidance are you providing to the rest of the organization to make those trade-offs? Uh, address critical vulnerabilities. So it's it's all well and good to say we want to be the leader in cloud computing in our industry, fine. Uh, or we want to shift to, you know, all digital capacity, fine. But what are the obstacles to doing that? Do you have the capabilities? What are your competitors doing? Are there nimble startups who are uh, uh, ahead of you? Are, you know, do companies like Google and others already have a, a, a large database that may, you'll have to overcome? Strategic priorities have to not only identify the key obstacles to uh, moving towards your desired future, they have to provide guidance on how to achieve those, incredible guidance on how to achieve those. Uh, provide con concrete guidance we've talked about. And then finally, align the top team, right? One of the biggest, so as we'll talk about in a moment, one of the biggest reasons that organizations struggle and have ineffective strategic priorities begins in the boardroom that the top team as a group has not done the hard work of coming to a shared set of objectives. And, you know, the various members of the team follow their own priorities, follow their own agendas, and that filters down throughout the organization, of course. So these are the characteristics of effective strategic priorities. Again, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Paul and his team published a very nice article uh, that, you can, um, uh, that you can read if you'd like to learn more about this. Okay, now let's shift to our second question, which is why doesn't anyone know your strategy? So most executives, senior executives, CEOs in particular that I spend a lot of time with, they think everybody should know their strategy because from their point of view, they are constantly communicating their strategy. And a lot of them assume that, that as a result, everyone understands their strategy. 
So a, a, an a executive that I and a couple of my, I and one of my colleagues were working with, I was CEO of a large medical devices company. And he sent out an employee engagement survey, uh, which said, do you agree with this statement? I am clear on the firm's top priorities. And he was delighted, delighted to see that 90, 97% of his key managers agreed or strongly agreed with that statement. So he said, well, everybody understands the strategy. I said, hmm, maybe, but why don't we ask the question in a different way? And we have an execution survey that we've administered to over 500 companies. Uh, and in that survey, it's designed to address some of the, the problems with uh, traditional employee engagement surveys when it comes to measuring in, um, execution. And what we do is instead of asking the question this way, do you agree or disagree with that statement? We actually ask key leaders, which the CEO identified, you know, the people responsible for executing the strategy. We said, okay, what are the strategic priorities for your company for the next five years? And this company had, they had a set of strategic priorities, clearly articulated five of them. They published them in their um, annual report, their, you know, uh, 10Ks. So they clearly had strategic priorities. There was a right answer. What the execution survey revealed is those same managers, the very ones responsible for executing the strategy, when asked to list the company's top five priorities, only one quarter of them could list even three of the company's five strategic priorities. And remember, this was not frontline employees. These were the very leaders, about 150 in this case, who were charged with executing the strategy. Now you might say, okay, you choose this example because it's a particularly egregious one, but this, you know, this would never happen here. What we see over a larger sample of companies uh, this is based on over 300 companies uh, who took the survey between 2012 and 2017. What we do is we give people five tries uh, to, uh, we say, you know, uh, what are your company's strategic priorities? We put the company's name in. We're very clear. We're talking about the strategic priorities of the company versus the business unit or the function. So the question's clear. And we give them five tries to list the strategic priorities. What we find is 84%, almost all, could mention, given five tries, could mention one of the priorities, which is okay. If you go down to how many could mention three of the five priorities, that number drops to under 30%. So basically the punchline we found is that it, when you survey the, the leaders responsible for executing your uh, strategy, on average, and of course there's variance across the sample, but on average, fewer than a third of them know what that strategy is. So it forces me to ask a, a Zen Cohen. So we all know what a Zen Cohen is. It's a, you know, a question that a Zen master poses to uh, bring enlightenment to his or her students. So, you know, classic Zen Cohen would be if a tree falls in the forest and no one hears it, does it make a sound? My version of a Zen Cohen is if a strategy falls into a company and no one understands it, does it make a difference? The answer to that Zen Cohen, by the way, is no, it does not make a difference. So it, it raises an interesting question. Why don't your distributed leaders, and by distributed leaders, we mean key leaders in the organization responsible for executing your strategy. Why don't those leaders know your strategy? You communicate it all the time. It's public. You know, you, uh, uh, it's in your annual reports, in your 10Ks. It's in, you know, you give people laminated cards to put in their wallets. Why don't they know this? Uh, and I, uh, along with uh, my colleagues, Charlie and uh, and James, uh, Yoder have looked at this question uh, with some uh, some very interesting and novel data set that uh, that no one's had their hands on before. Um, and basically, what we've done is for a sample of 125 uh, organizations, large organizations, typical or organizations, uh, uh, would have thousands of employees. A and what we've done is we've asked this question: uh, uh, you know, what are your company's uh, strategic priorities over the next couple of years? and then analyze what are the factors that lead to either the leaders understanding what the priorities are, which is what you want, of course, or the leaders not knowing what the priorities are. And I'll just walk you through our four key findings. So the first one is senior leaders, senior executives, don't know that they have a problem, right? So what this chart shows, and it's a very busy chart, um, uh, and again, uh, this is in uh, one of the articles that we've uh, we've published with the Sloan Management Review. But basically, what this uh, uh, what this chart is showing, and we won't go through everything uh, line by line, but to give you the sense of it, is these are items in our survey meant to analyze 
how well leaders think the company's doing in terms of strategic alignment. Okay, and there are a variety of these. We, our priorities support our strategy, or our strategic priorities have the resources required to succeed, and so forth. The the 50th percentile represents. We say, okay, uh, if the if your middle managers and your frontline supervisors said your company was average, so we normalize the responses of these companies to the 50th percentile for the um, uh, middle managers and frontline supervisors. If if they said we're average, which of course on average they are average, what would the top management teams say? And that's what this green line represents. So the, the green bar here represents the difference between how optimistically top teams assess each of these items versus how optimistically the middle managers and frontline set supervisors assess these items. And, and the point I want to draw your attention to is every one of these is green. That is to say, on every single measure of alignment, without exception, Top management teams think their organization is doing better than they are, including my favorite, top leaders communicate strategy clearly and consistently over time. Top leaders think they're doing very well. You know, the people whose job, who are listening to and supposed to understand that strategy think they're doing less well. And by the way, for the statisticians in the room, uh, the, uh, the difference in these means is significant at point zero 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 one. So this is not a, a, an artifact of a small sample or a bizarre draw. Uh, these are quite robust findings, which is interesting because every top team I talk to says, oh, you know, but we're very hard on ourselves. We're, you know, we're really tough graders. The odds are very high that you are not tough graders. So that's the first thing. Part of the reason organizations don't, lead, people throughout the organization don't know the strategy is top leaders don't even know it's a problem. They think everything's fine. The second um, so let me step back and just explain what this chart is. Uh, it's a bit of a busy chart. So basically what we've done in this chart is we've said these are we've divided uh, the sample into four levels in the organization. The top team members, the CEO and his or her direct reports, executives who report to the top team, middle managers, executives, vice presidents, directors who do not report to the top team. And then frontline managers, supervisors, team leads. Okay, so we've we've uh, we've looked at, cut the data by these four levels in the organization across the sample of 124 uh, organizations. And then what these bars are measuring is what percentage of the leaders, on average, in those uh, at each level, uh, can list three of the company's top five priorities. Okay, so what we see at the top team level is that on average, about half of the top team can list three of the company's uh, top five priorities. So, and then at the, the, among uh, people who report to the top team, 22% uh, can uh, list three of the company's five, top five priorities and so forth as we go down. So, How does this help us to understand why organizations, uh, why leaders in organizations don't know their, uh, the strategic priorities? I mean, first of all, it clearly illustrates that that is the case. By the time you get down to frontline uh, managers, uh, fewer than 15 percent, fewer than one in six know the company's strategic priorities. But how does this help us to understand why that is the case? Well, there are two things it sheds light on. First, there's a lot of disagreement among top teams. I mean, think about that. Your top team responsible for the company as a whole, only half of them on average can list three of the company's five official or four official priorities, right? So this is a big part of the problem. A lot of the problem in many organizations, the problem all starts with the fact that the top team themselves disagree on what matters most, okay? So that's the second factor, top team disagrees on key priorities. The third thing which is very interesting is note this, there is a decay in, in terms of strategic uh, alignment as you go down the organization. That's not surprising. What I find surprising is um, that there's a sharp drop here between top teams and the members reporting their top teams. You drop from 51% to 22%, and then a gradual dec decay thereafter. And that's kind of the opposite of what we expected, what uh, Charlie and James and I expected to see, because we thought, well, of course, the, the, the closer you are to the top, the more likely you are to know the, the strategic priorities, but that the, we thought the big drop-off would be here. 
And so we talked to some teams and tried to, inter- you know, did some interviews and tried to understand what was going on. And what we found and what we learned very interestingly is the top teams, they, members of the top team, they're in charge of their function or business unit or division. And they're all also responsible for the uh, running the company as a whole. So they have kind of dual citizenship, corporate citizenship or enterprise citizenship and their business unit function, the division. And so for them, it kind of makes sense that they would, you know, at least half of them would know the strategic priorities. When you go down the next level, they only have one citizenship. They only have one passport. They're responsible for their function, division, uh, uh, or business unit geography, right? They don't have enterprise responsibility. So unless the top team does a very good job of communicating to their direct reports what the enterprise level or organizational level priorities are and why they matter to their function, division, uh, or business unit, you're going to see a big drop off in understanding. And, and that's what's happening. It's, it's, we call it the valley of death. Make, communicating strategic priorities from the top team down to their direct reports. Because as you see, the direct reports actually do a pretty good job of communicating at one level down. There's a relatively limited uh, loss of, uh, of uh, alignment as you uh, go the next step down. And then the, uh, the final reason that people don't understand your strategy is that the distributed leaders, again, those key uh, managers and, and thought leaders throughout the organization responsible, critical, uh, responsible for executing the strategy, they don't explain to their teams why their team's goals matter for the company as a whole. OK, so we have in the survey, uh, this execution survey we've done, we've looked at, uh, I think there were about 70 uh, factors that could potentially predict strategic alignment. That is to say, what percentage of people know what your strategy is? 70 factors. And, and there were several of them that, you know, mattered a little bit, like did executives participate in uh, formulating the strategy? If they did, for instance, they were more like, uh, they were more likely to be aligned and so forth. So uh, fine. The single biggest factor that we found consistent across multiple models, uh, multiple specifications of the models, stood head and shoulders above all the rest was this. If managers at every level in the organization explain to their team why their team's goals matter, not only for their function, division, or business unit, but for the company as a whole, if they do that, the level of alignment in the organization is much, much higher. Single best predictor of alignment. So that that really matters. That one very tactical, tangible thing, communicating you know, when you go to your teams explaining, here's what we're working on, here's why it matters for us, but here's how, how it supports the company's strategy as a whole. Explaining uh, goals in those terms is the single biggest uh, predictor of strategic alignment at the company level, at least in our data set. So given that, it's a little disheartening to see that basically only 45% of managers in our sample consistently explain to their team why their goals matter, both for the company and for their team. 39% of managers in our sample only explain why their goals matter for the team. They don't talk about the implications for corporate strategy. And then 16% either struggle to explain why the goals matter at all or rarely explain why goals matter. So they don't even take the time to explain why the goals matter. So uh, this, uh, this covers We've now talked about what makes a uh, strategy for execution effective, and we've talked about why um, why distributed leaders don't know what your strategy is. I think given that we're uh, we're just about at 20 minutes now, maybe what I'll do is I'll open it up to, uh, to Q&A, and then um, uh, if folks want to, uh, you, you know, the question may come up how, how you develop stra- uh, strategic priorities. Uh, that are effective, and, and, and yeah, I'll go through that content a little bit. So at this point, I'm going to shift to webcam, and uh, okay, there we are. You can see my office behind me. That's my office at MIT. And uh, so, what questions do we have? Uh, Don, we've got a lot of questions. Um, so okay. thanks to everyone who's been submitting them, and we'll get to as many as we can. Inevitably, we won't get to them all, but thank you. Um, you're, you're, you're showing huge engagement audience. We really appreciate it. So, Don, let's begin here. If strategy is a framework to guide critical choices so as to achieve a desired future, 
It's a two-part question. Um, one, where does the desired future come from? And two, do the three to five strategic priorities equal the framework for that future? Uh, so two is yes. Uh, so that's the intent. The, the uh, strategic priorities are meant to provide that framework. It's not to say you don't supplement them with, you know, other communication and other discussions. Of course you do, but that's the that's the role that they're playing. Uh, where the desired future comes from, that's a terrific question. Um, you know, that's a question around an organization's vision or mission uh, or purpose. And, uh, you know, for established companies, that often comes from the founder uh, and the legacy of the company. Uh, you know, you take an organization like Johnson & Johnson, which has been around for more than a century. They, uh, you know, they have a, a purpose and credo uh, around um, uh, providing health. And, uh, you know, that's been around for a long time. So in, uh, you know, in established companies that you'll, in a sense, that will be a, a, a given or a, a function of historical choices. Um, for newer companies, that's a discretionary choice, right? You can articulate your vision. And I think an important thing for entrepreneurs to think about is, uh, you know, it's, of course, strategy matters, of course, uh, execution matters, but uh, you want to give some thought to where where you're trying to head, where that desired endpoint is. Otherwise, it's, it's very likely that you'll just get locked in uh, in your strategy and in your execution to very um, tactical decisions. So, Don, you mentioned um, entrepreneurs there and, and kind of answered that question in somewhat of a startup context, and that relates to several questions that came in. And is this is is this framework that you're presenting kind of universally applicable across organizational types, maturity of organization, industry? Uh, yeah, I think yeah, we see it for. I, I, I mean, uh, certainly across size of organization, yes. So uh, you know, as 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 I noted in the slides, it's very prevalent among. Uh, uh, large corporations. There's no question about that. If you look at the startup domain, uh, slightly different terminology is often used. Objectives and key results is the, you know, kind of phrase of art in, um, uh, in Silicon Valley, but it's the exact same thing. I mean, if you look at how Google does their, their corporate lo- level OKRs or Facebook or, uh, or, you know, any of the portfolio companies that, uh, that John Doerr has worked with, it takes exactly this format. It's a, you know, a handful, a three to five, uh, priorities, uh, they call them objectives, uh, the, for the company. And even in those domains, despite moving quickly, uh, you know, those will typically last, uh, you know, a few years at least, often three to five years. So, um, across size of the organization, for sure. And the, and the reason I think that's the case is, uh, and across industry, for sure. Um, uh, the reason I think that's the case is, Every company faces trade-offs. If you're, if you're a large company, the trade-offs are because you have so many competing interests and stakeholders and objectives that you need to make some trade-offs between those, many of which are specialized in kind of doing their own thing. If you're a small company, if you're a startup or rapidly growing company, you have to make trade-offs because there are a lot more opportunities than you have resources. So the reason you have to make trade-offs may be different, but the need to make those trade-offs is the same, and uh, and we see these, uh, you know, the, this uh, tool sometimes with slightly different terminology. Again, don't get hung up on the terminology um, uh, being used in very different domains, and to great effect. Great, thanks. So, I'm, I'm in some cases, um, audience, I'm 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 picking up themes from several questions and kind of creating new questions out of yours. So, thank you. Um, there, I think some people are looking for um, maybe a more precise differentiation. Um, in terms of some of the language you use, so between strategy, a strategy of extra execution, and strategic priorities, I think one question captured this well. Are, are strategic priorities just the, the method for communicating the strategy, or is there, a, is there a different way the audience should be thinking about that? No. So for a strategy for execution is a broad construct. It's you know basically a framework to guide decisions to get from where you are to where you want to be that balances guidance and flexibility. Okay, so that's a strategy for execution. Strategic priorities are one mechanism to do that. You can imagine other mechanisms. A very popular one is the house of strategy, which tries to, you know, kind of convey what your strategy is doing but leave flexibility. There might be, I don't know, a dozen, 15, 20 other mechanisms. Strategic priorities are the most common. They're the best studied. I think they're probably among the most effective, if not the most effective. So the first thing is strategic strategy for execution is a, a, a broad construct of which there are multiple tools. The most prevalent, I think probably the most effective, certainly the best studied is strategic priorities. Second question, is our strategic priorities just a mechanism to trans, to communicate the strategy? No, no, not at all. I mean, probably their primary role is as a forcing mechanism 
to get your executive team to agree on what the handful of must-win battles are. Then, having done that, of course, you communicate that. But this is a living document that forces prioritization, that helps you to think through, okay, if those are the things we're focused in on, what are the metrics we're going to associate with these objectives? Called key results in the you know, Silicon Valley terminology in larger companies is often metrics and milestones to measure your goals or KPIs. Again, the terminology doesn't matter much. So forces clarity of thought on how you measure progress and how you're going to achieve those overarching objectives. Uh, it, um, provides a framework for those uh, measures, provides a framework for making prioritization investment uh, uh, trade-offs throughout the organization, and is also a tool for communication. So it's much more than just a tool for communication. And I think, by the way, it's quite problematic when executives think of it in those terms. So I was with a, a very large uh, retail company last week, and they have a set of strategic priorities, and they, uh, not surprisingly, they're you know, a, a marketing company, they're a reformed company, iconic brand company. They communicate the heck out of their strategic priorities, but they've become little more than buzzwords. They're marketing catchphrases. They're not guiding decisions. They're not forcing hard trade-offs. The top team hasn't made those hard trade-offs. And, and so it's, it's really dangerous to think about strategic priorities as only a tool of communication. That's one role they play, uh, but it's not necessarily the most important. It's certainly not the only. Great. So you've mentioned the importance of language um, uh, a number of times um, during the presentation. And just now, do you have any favorite bad strategy words? <laughs> well, I would refer you back to my uh, my chart on uh, uh, of buzzword bingo. Uh, that's kind of my consolidate. The, the, the words and phrases that bug me the most at any point in time. Um, yeah, right now, crypto seems to be like you put crypto in front of anything and you're, you know, you, uh, you increase your, uh, your market cap 10x. I, I, I don't think that's a long term. Good ploy, but anyway. All right, great. Um, here's, a, here's an interesting question. Peter Drucker said, 90% of the time, you do not know what your real objectives are. Um, how does that point relate to your um, framework or your thinking about strategic priorities? Oh, I, I think that's taken out of context. Peter Drucker wrote the seminal book uh, on man, what was called Management by Objectives. He wrote an entire book on using management by objectives. I, I think that's a uh, quotes not at all representative of his thinking. I mean, I think the point Drucker was making, I'm very familiar with his work and, and that quote in particular, was it, that the objectives become clearer over time, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and that's, that's both true and a very practical insight. Uh, but that's, that's not at all representative of Peter Drucker's work. I mean, look at his 1954 book, uh, uh, and the, um, the entire body of, uh, of literature on management by objectives itself. Uh, it's, you know, he's making a, a, it's a nuanced point around a, a much more fundamental, uh, emphasis on the importance of objectives as a tool for management. So then a, then a follow on, and, and, and again, this picks up on a number of, of questions from from the audience is, how does the way you manage smat strategy relate to the speed of the market? In other words, is three to five years, is that kind of a permanent horizon? How do you incorporate, you know, the dynamism of the market into your thinking? Well, that's a terrific question. So first thing to note is people think like, oh, it's a dynamic market. I'm going to set one year objectives. Okay, right. So you're going to say one of your objectives, or one of the companies I'm working with, their objective is to build digital capacity, to build digital capability and analytics capability. In a, you know, 10,000 employee uh, organization has been around 50 years. You're going to do that in a year? I mean, you can say it's a one-year objective. It's going to take you five years. Some things just take that long. You know, you're going to enter the China market. You're going to do it in a year. It's going to take you five years, right? So, again, the kinds of things that matter to move the needle to really create a uh, value, to really make progress for big companies, they often take time. And you can pretend that they don't or be delusional and think you're going to be the one company in history that can do something in a year that takes everybody else five years. It's not going to happen. Okay, so that's the first point. So then the question becomes, and this is, I think, a terrific question, how do you account for the fact that you're going to learn along the way. So say you have digital uh, capabilities. You want to build digital capabilities, analytics capabilities. And you know that matters, right? And you know that's going to matter five years from now. Or you know, you know, it's hard to say no with 100% certainty, but you're willing to make a bet on that. Because all, all objectives are bets, right? You're making a bet that this is going to matter in five years. And, you know, you can't get away from that. There's some element of, of that that's unavoidable. Um, but let's you say, okay, digital, we've, we've got to, you know, we've, uh, we've really, we think this is a good bet. We're going to bet on it as objective. 
what a lot of companies do, and I think very sensibly, is underneath the overarching objective, which might last for five years is you'll have a set of what in um, Silicon Valley are typically referred to as key results. And these are basically metrics or milestones that support the overall objective that are uh, that help you to measure progress and also provide some guidance as to how you're going to achieve that objective. OK, and what we see certainly in Silicon, you know, so to be, take a domain where there's a lot of, of volatility. So in uh, Silicon Valley tech startups is these objectives will be constant over three to five years. The wording may change a little bit, but, uh, you know, the basic uh, you know, notion of, um, uh, you know, is building a uh, peer to peer platform, for instance, it's going to take you three to five years. So that basically stays the same, let's say. But those key results underneath, those could be changing on a quarterly basis uh, and often. Often are. So what happens is the objective links you to the overarching strategy, to the big picture, to the longer term, and those key priorities, which are more fluid over time and are changing over time, allow you to adjust, to learn. You say, hey, you know, we thought this was going to work. It didn't. Let's try this. Or, OK, we achieved that. What's the next key priority to support the, uh, uh, the objective? So the answer is to build, is not to try to do in one year what is going to take you five years, because that's just delusional. The answer is to make a few bets on a few things that last, you know, are going to take you a while to do, but will be worth doing and make a significant difference once you do, but have the fluctuation and the change and the adaptation happen as a result of key, at the level of key results or metrics and milestones, whatever you want to call those. And again, the cap those, that should be three to five per objective. Um, and, and, you know, you know, that's, and by the way, even among these, you know, volatile, fast moving, uh, uh, Silicon Valley companies, you know, these things take three to five years. As, you know, as Jeff Bezos says, a lot of people are competing for next year where you really make money is competing for five years out. And, and, and that's true. Don, do you have any suggestions on tools or approaches that organizations can use to kind of assess their capabilities um, to develop effective strategic priorities? And maybe maybe what the, the, the questioner is, is, is really asking is, how do you do a self-assessment? Well, one thing you could do is go through the, you know, the seven characteristics I talked about earlier. Uh, uh, that's what it was designed to do. So that, that would be a, a good place to start, I think. Uh, great. Um, so, um, what are some of your favorite strategy books? Uh, I like Dick Rumelt's, um, gosh, I always forget the names of these strategy books. I'm just looking at my, uh, uh, just looking at my shelf now. So let's see. Um, whatever Dick Rumelt, just look Dick Rumelt and latest strategy book on Amazon to find it. Uh, that was a terrific piece of work. Uh, I think, you know, not necessarily book, um, but, uh, Mike, Michael Porter's 1996, I think it was, article, What is Strategy? Enduring Classic. Terrific piece of work. Um, just looking at my bookshelf here. What else do I like? Uh, there's a lot I don't like. I have to admit that. Uh, uh, what else do I have here? Uh, well, if you want to throw anybody under the bus, feel free. No, I, you know, <laughs> no point doing that. But, um, yeah, I like Rumel. I, I like Porter. Um, <laughs> I guess I don't like that many. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thanks. We certainly got some good, good, good recommendations there for, uh, for yeah. the audience. Yeah. Don, yeah. Any... No, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say my, you know, my, I, I think there's a well-established body of, um, of research that, you know, any textbook will cover with resources and capabilities and market positioning and five forces and, you know, basically any, uh, you know, quarter's a great starting point, but uh, any any of the strategy textbooks will be a great, you know, overview. And so in a sense, it's almost, I'd almost urge folks to do that rather than looking at a specific book because this is, you know, this field is 50 years old, more than, uh, as a cumulative body of knowledge. So I think a synthesis that you find in a textbook would be, um, uh, really more useful than, you, you know, everybody's trying to, at this point, make their incremental contribution to a, an established body uh, of of knowledge. So, um, uh, yeah, so I think that would be my, the approach I would recommend. Thanks. Do you have any data on how many um, of the typical, of a company's typical, of a company's strategic priorities, I think that the question is asking on average, um, are internal and operationally focused versus external? Uh, whew, that's a good question. We do have that data. We've never cut it that way. Um, 
We could do. That's a great question. Oh, we have that data. We've never cut it, but we uh, we could do that. Oh, great. So future project. Um, here's an interesting question. If 51% of top teams um, disagree on strategic priorities, and if your definition of strategy is three to five key priorities, then isn't the explanation for this that the organization I'm sorry, isn't the explanation for why the organization doesn't understand the company's strategy that it doesn't exist? Yes, in, in, in some cases, yeah. Not always. I mean, there are, remember, this is a mean, so there are some companies where, you know, 80, 90 percent of the top leaders know what the strategy is and agree on it, and there are other things going on. But, yeah, uh, precisely. That um, is, uh, yeah. Great. I mean, so there may what? No, or there, on, continue. It's not that they don't ex it doesn't exist. It's, well, it this is a terminological point, but it's there are multiple competing strategies going on within the company. That's what's typically happening. So it's not a complete void of strategy. People will, you know, some, you know, there'll be little factions. They have their views of what the strategy is, and their silos are pursuing those strategies, and they're kind of competing with one another is the way I'd. But it, if you want to phrase it that there's no strategy when you define strategies and agreed upon at the corporate level group of strategic priorities for the company as a whole in the next three to five years, then, yes, that's correct. Um, Don, there, there are a few questions, um, again, kind of on this theme, and it's the relationship between um, leaders creating a sense of urgency and their ability to execute strategy. Do you see a relationship between those things? Between a sense of urgency? I, I don't understand how you could disentangle them. I mean, I, I think they're two sides of the same coin. I mean, um, the execute – so the, the – I mean, execution is a much broader topic, right? I mean, there are a lot of things that go into execution. There's culture, there are goals, there are resource allocation processes, there are distributed leaders, there are top teams, there are a bunch of components. So let's, uh, rather, let's kind of scope the question more narrowly and keep it on the theme we're talking about here, which is around strategic priorities. I would say, mm -hmm. you know, strategic priorities at their heart about is about what matters most now, right? And the now not being today, but over a three to five time period, a time horizon, right? So it's, a lot of stuff matters. There's a lot of things that you should be focusing in on. Some are business as usual. So some will have to get done anyway. Uh, and, you know, but what focus, you know, what matters most now? And the, the now element of, is what drives urgency. And so bringing, concrete, you know, sort of saying of all the things we could focus in on, these are the ones that matter now. And I'll give you an example. There was a company uh, that I was uh, with a couple of weeks ago, a different medical devices company where uh, they have an ERP deployment going on. And it was one of several things going on. And, you know, they had kind of committed to it. But when they really got together as a team and realized it was kind of a make or break decision for the uh, company's ability to continue to acquire companies and uh, integrate them into the system and, and scale, they realized, wow, we really have to make this work. And so that kind of rose to the top of the strategic priorities and said, you know, over the next three years, this is make or break. You know, some of our best people are going to be devoted 100 percent of our their time to this. We're going to kill other things in order to get this done. Uh, you know, we're going to communicate to, to investors that we're, um, you know, we're going to uh, uh, invest more money in this. It'll, it'll drop our earnings potentially a little bit. And so. All of that was to say this matters most now and bring a sense of urgency to, uh, to that, uh, that specific activity. And so, um, uh, uh, and you know, not say other things don't matter. They matter, but we can afford to delay them. So, uh, to me, that's one of the primary roles of strategic priorities is building in a sense of urgency on what matters most now. Uh, great. I think we probably have time for one, maybe two more questions. So where can where can people go to see a company's strategic priorities and any recommendations for companies that 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 do this well beyond the examples that you shared? Um, so you can go to their 10 Ks or their annual reports. That's where we found them. Uh, so it's they're not particularly hard to find. I mean, some companies have them, but don't publish them. I think Apple has strategic priorities chooses not to publish them. Again, that's about you know, 20, 30 percent of the I mean, well, the ones that don't publish them, we don't know whether they don't have them and therefore don't publish them or have them and don't publish them. But we know some have them and don't publish them. But, you know, 70 percent of the S&P 500 companies uh, uh, had them. And, um, yeah, so uh, so that's um, uh, that's where you find them. I, again, there's another article that uh, I published with uh, Stefano Tricconi, a colleague at the London Business School. Uh, which talked about communicating good strategic priorities. And there we listed six um, 
uh, tactics for communicating your priorities uh, more clearly. Uh, and we have some uh, concrete examples of what we thought were good priorities there. So I'd, I'd refer um, refer folks to that article. That's a, a very short piece uh, and, and uh, you know, published by SMR, available online. Great. Don, thank you very much. I think that's all the time we have for the Q&A session today. And my apologies to the many questions we didn't, didn't get to. And then thank you for audience for being so generous with your questions. Over the next few days, please look for a feedback survey that we'll send out via email, and we really appreciate your thoughts and opinions. And a reminder that a recording of this program will be available within three to four business days. And that concludes our program. Thank you for attending, and thank you again to Don Sol. Terrific. Thanks.